What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG, and as always, it's my continuing mission to bring you reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. Now, today, we're hurry hurrying into the Skaven stronghold known as Vermintide 2, where Vermintide 1 was a four player romp against the evil rat hordes. The developer Fat Shark said, You know what? Remember, this is based on a role playing game that might as well have a skill called Fuck It, so let's just add some more enemies. And they did. And that's in the form of the Chaos Tribe, creatures who the lack of a better description look like a cross between Vikings and dudes who fell into the same vat of chemicals that guy from the original Robocop movie did. But you can't just do that because then it wouldn't be called a game, it'd be called losing. So they decided to help the player a little bit and to combat the warp tides, Fat Shark has adjusted the characters. The five characters that you have up to four at a time now each have three careers apiece for a total of 15. They gave skill trees to each individual career and then rubbed a somewhat renewed loot system into it and invited players to join in. Let's see how they did, shall we? As always, if you like the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Vermintide 2. Roll for wall grab, sentient New York sewer rats, and forging weapons in the fiery heat of fantasy easy-bake ovens. Graphics are up first. You know, odd issues aside, the original Vermintide was an excellent collection of unique locations and long journeys through mire and muck, the likes of which almost no one ever wants to experience in life. Vermintide 2 significantly upgrades that. First, hats off to the level construction, and while not open-ended with thousands of crisscrossing paths, there are enough that a sneak attack through a back alley is possible, or finding this hidden cellar door in a burnt-out home and following it through tunnels and popping up on the other side of the city can all actually be done. And there really are some notable standouts like Against the Grain, which has you sprinting through wheat fields and into forests and is really an excellent collection of wide open spaces and narrow cramped places that highlights a player's need for communication and level knowledge from that point on. Or Hail Scourge, which reminds me a bit of Gears of War, where the world was falling apart around them at one particular time. Here, you're battling on the ruins of a town falling into a crater. Bat Shark really absolutely nailed the environmental look of this fiction, from the thick fog of sewers choked with sacrificial offerings to burned out towns still sending cinders into the sky as you fight through them. That doesn't mean they're all perfect though, and in particular, one level and one area where you're firing off catapults into the enemy's warp throwers hundreds of yards away, that entire place just did not actually look done or really seeped in the decay and detritus that the rest of the landscape actually had, which was environmentally a little off-putting. Vermintide 2 also turns their particle game to 11. The developer meeting must have been hilarious when someone said, you know what, dude, I made a particle emitter that emits more particle emitters because damn, from burned out cinders to the bits of fire that escape the fire mage's hands to the body flies, the swamp particles, it is insane and causes you to almost want to squint a little bit as you're playing. Very cool effects. Also, character-wise, the game has really turned it up with two types of enemies and over 20 subtypes. You can find yourself facing off against a giant bipedal creature with another mouth for its stomach, to noxious gas-filling storm vermin, to chaos warriors decked out in enough armor. It looks like they fell into a car maker's assembly line, and everyone just said, eh, let's see what happens. Now, when it comes to performance, I have to say I was impressed. Of course, I am using a current generation i7 and a 1080 Ti, so I also test it on the 1080 and the 970. With all the settings at Ultra, even at 1080p or 1440p, the game shines and only drops frames a large amount of the time when the game's AI director goes nuts and basically just points at a spot and says, fuck this particular place. As with all things, there are some particular settings that do hit it harder rather than others, like depth of field and shadows, of course, so if you're having performance issues, that is the first place to go. As a complete package, I would just say I really like the look of Vermintide 1. I love the look of Vermintide 2. This is a world that I've always enjoyed exploring, and this game, and especially some of those maps, really ups the game. Sound, music, and voice. Taste my axe! <laughs> This is a waste of time. Bandages, tinctures, aye, we have need of such. Never did like potions. Get the fish. Hold up, I'm drinking. And you know what? Let's do voice first. Listen, this is good, but it's one-liners quipped out about a thousand times in a single level, and having the elf tease your footwork again and again and again, even if you're just standing there on the lift waiting to be transported, you start to wonder if they're filling the silence with talking because they all hate each other. Overall, it's good, and I like what they've chosen, as well as I like the fact that if you take different careers, some of the lines change to reflect that. Brings a bit of fresh beat into the game when one wasn't really expected. Overall, pretty good, but nothing really exemplary. Sound. 
Many may not pick up on this, but really sound in a game like this is absolutely vital and it's done very well here. And it's not just the processing that we see on the various different elements like we would expect, like when you enter a massive catacomb from a series of tightly wound steps behind you and the audio envelope opens up, but it's also the information of the player. No matter how chaotic it is, no player is going to mistake the clang of a sword ringing off a shield, even if it's not theirs. And a critical hit, which does more damage to enemies, also has a different sound that's a little bit higher and easier to discern over the destruction that's playing around. Also, you have special enemies that all have their own unique little bits of sound, so if you listen close enough, you can usually track them via that alone, or at least watch them as they leap and kill you. Now, environmentally, it's going to be hard to hear because most of the time you're fighting people off, but if you do get a chance, you'll hear some excellent choices for ambience, like the creaking of wood frames on buildings ready to fall into massive holes, or far-off battle sounds that sort of indicate where you need to go next. It's very well done. When it comes to the audio options, we have bog-standard stereo theater headphones and dynamic range choices. And of course, that brings us to music, Jesper Kidd. And normally just saying his name three times summons him like Beetlejuice, so I'll make sure not to. But most folks know that for the most part, Jesper is always at the top of his game and has pretty much the coolest name in the biz. Now, this is slightly changed from Vermintide 1 soundtrack, which Jesper also did, but it's larger here and more natural, has some percussion series of tracks to it that really audibly connect those new Chaos Forces tribes with the locations and really does an incredible job setting the tone across the board. When you think back on it, Vermintide really has a primal feeling to its audio tracks, but it's even more prevalent here, and it consistently makes you think, if I look behind me right now, there's probably going to be 40 dwarves just banging away on Skaven skin drums. Sadly, that's not true, but very good music. Gameplay. And a bit about the story. Now, Warhammer tells the continuing story of Bard and Victor and three other members of Team Grimdark after the original Vermintide game ended. Taken prisoner and behind enemy lines, the game starts with a prologue centered around escape, the Skaven's continued failure of ever successfully pulling off a plan and hammering the crap out of anything that moves. Then the ragtag B team heads out to stem the end of times. What made Vermintide special, and a couple other titles as well, is their eschewing of the usually enforced typical plop 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 of enemy placement like some well-meaning dictator putting guards around a villa. And instead, you have this artificial intelligence, or as they call it, an AI director, that watches the game as you progress and spawns in enemies to keep the pace of battle like a well-timed dance. If, of course, your dancers were armed with claymores and a magic wand from Harry Potter's stash. And that flexibility in the engagement rate is both the magic Vermintide 2 offers, but also where a couple little failures end up happening. First, the good. You leap into the game and choose to play as one of the five characters, each with a series of abilities that are unlocked at 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25 level. You can outfit them with weapons, cosmetics like skins for the armor, trinkets, charms, and so forth, all of those adding to the character's overall power level. And depending on the rarity of the item, also adding abilities like resistance to curses, critical hit chances, and other skill increases. But what's been added here is the ability for later classes. At level 9 and 12, you can split off, and this offers a chance to have a play in a style that's actually rather interestingly different, as they change both the active and the passive character skills, as well as allows for completely different ability trees to be chosen, resulting in each main character having a total of three classes with 75 skills, 25 per class. For example, Marcus, he starts out as a mercenary, his passive skill being that that if he slices through enough enemies at any one time, his attack speed leaps up 10%. And the active skill that staggers enemies, it gives nearby allies a bit of health as well. Each of the class's passive and active skills are somewhat like that, where they really fit the build and then let you grab abilities as you see fit from the new tree. And if you decide to change Marcus into a footman, you actually increase damage resistance to allies around you, and you have a footman charge, which allows you to plow through enemies, turning Marcus into more of a pick-and-choose battler with enough skill choices up close to do damage, but more of a teamwork-oriented class. While the Battle Wizard, for example, their skills automatically lock onto their desire to see the world burn with a teleport that leaves a fiery trail behind it. And couple that with something like Soul Snare, which they get later, it means you can leave a trail of destruction behind you that actually grants you life as it kills enemies, which I have to assume is pretty much the part of any pyromaniac's workflow. Now, once you've outfitted your fighters, decked out your dwarves, and festooned your fire wizards with enough friggin' bedazzled items you could be seen from orbit, it's time to enter battle. You have three paths across 13 levels and then the main boss level. Levels have to be taken on one after the other, but once you beat them, you can jump into them as well as having heroic deeds attached to them. Consider those mutators. They basically make it harder, but their EXP bonuses are commensurate with that. Now, gameplay is still fairly tight, with blocking being a much more important avenue towards success than the game's visuals would really have you believe, with the ability to parry, block quick attacks, and interrupt chain combos with blocks to reset the combo itself, which can absolutely help depending on the enemies you face and the way your combos work. It's also a bit more complex than I think people really realize. 
Also, blocking works for enemies all around you. It's a cool system if a bit unrealistic. You can also push enemies away, which, depending on the weapon, can send some flying, which really helps crowd control. When it comes to range, there are a number of bows and crossbows and rifles, as well as many with their own special properties in the later rarities, which can really change up your tactics. Each weapon has its overall spread as well, so you have a mace and a shield, which might have a normal swinging arc, but a sword that can take folks out at 90 degrees. This results in a good deal of thought sometimes before entering a level, because sometimes you can sort of guess what kind of enemy you might run into. Also, I have to say right now, I adore some of the level's sheer complexity in scale, and as I said before, world fiction. It's off the charts, and it doesn't matter if you're trucking it through the back trail of some farmer's wheat field, the dwarf's tip of his helmet is the only thing you can see, or the later levels within large cities that at times offer you a quick view of just how complex they can be in their architecture, if maybe not so much their gameplay paths, because while there are many ways to get to the end goal, in most of the levels, it's never so much so that you find yourself getting lost, and every level's design philosophy seems based in offering a slightly different experience that builds on the knowledge from prior levels. For example, for running through the pasture lands, you find this increased reliance on teamwork if you're the dwarf because you can't see where a lot of the characters are or they can't see where you are. And that's an absolute godsend later in some of the more difficult areas and spaces that you end up fighting where you really do have to work on your communication and crowd control. That being said, I really didn't like it whenever the game asked me to do something else that wasn't the fighting, like lighting a cannon or grabbing a cannonball. It never really felt like it worked with the level structure itself. Luckily, there's a few and far in between. And of course, while traipsing through the world's worst travel agent brochure, occasionally you're going to win, which unlocks crates. Swords, bows, mini Gatling guns, shields, swords and shields, hammers and shields, maces and magic wands. It sounds as awesome as it is. Vermintide 2 has the typical colored loot system, white, green, blue, orange and red, with orange and red adding traits to the already offered properties that green and blue offer. In fact, it's only the white labeled weapons that have nothing really aside from their basic power to offer. All the weapons will explain what they're good at, like fast strike, shield breaking, and so forth. And of course, shield breaking is insanely useful against, well, shielded enemies or armored bad guys who can just really wreak havoc in a group. I will say, though, that this makes the loot system feel a bit odd at times. Now, admittedly, the properties and traits can completely change the way a character feels, regardless of the class you've already chosen, especially if you stack bonuses or outfit them accordingly. The problem is, is that some of these skills just don't translate well onto the screen, like the character dodge space bonus, and it can be an anticlimactic affair to leap into battle and then be like, yeah, 10% of nothing seems to be nothing. And even though it's making a change, it would have been great to have a better physical representation of it on screen. Now here, if you die during the game, which has various causes I'll describe in a bit, you still get experience, which is a change from the original title, which rewarded your half hour of hard work belittled by death with absolutely friggin' nothing. But let's say you don't get that long-awaited longsword. Vermintide 2 steps up to the plate with some crafting. You can salvage items, which results in various levels of scrap that you can then forge new items with. You can upgrade items, re-roll weapon bonuses, remove graphical illusions from weapons, and add them to others. It's not really an unusual system, and it works fairly well. Now, as you guys know, I test games on all difficulties, and here difficulties are parsed by hero power level, which is in turn a mixture of your base hero level and the items you have. So Plain Recruit is available to everyone, while Veteran, Champion, and Legend are available as you collect, craft, and kill your way through the game. And man, they get hard. Recruit is easily doable by most gamers, especially if you learn how to work as a team and effectively block. Because a game that looks this action-packed and bloody relies, like I said, on understanding blocking and parrying more than it appears to. Each step above that difficulty raises enemies' health, hit resistance, and just overall aggressiveness, but then lowers the number of items dropped for you. Now, to me, this wasn't an issue until Legendary Difficulty, which I felt it was a little bit off. That's because the bosses can appear fairly spongy, even when you take into account they're sucking directly from the diseased tit of a Chaos God to give them power. It still felt a little odd. Also, another problem I had with the game is, man, it loves to spawn special enemies a lot. And when I say a lot, I mean all the friggin' time. And that's when the teamwork's so important on the lower difficulties, but downright absolutely the difference between life and death on the later ones because getting a comrade jumped by an assassin and another drug off by a rat carrying a hoop and it can be devastating when you try to chase them down but then you add in a chaos warrior or two and then another skaven horde that can be brutal but when i say brutal i don't mean impossible because the balance between brutality and busting ass through cool looking levels like a fantasy inspired j-pop band is really what vermintide 2 does well it gets it right most of the time there are times when your death seems like it was preordained and a chance of living was lower than the chance of, well, anything else actually happening, but overall, it felt pretty fair. And really, when you look at the way the bots were handled in Vermintide 1 to Vermintide 2, I think there were some increases there. There's a couple little issues here and there, but nothing horrible.
Now, when it comes to multiplayer, you can join or host or do private games. And again, the private games will take your bots into them if you have spaces. Overall, this worked incredibly well. And as a technical package, when it comes to multiplayer, I was really surprised. I had absolutely zero issues. Really surprising. Fun factor. Vermintide 1 was incredibly fun. It was a top to bottom romp through enemies, stomping grounds, killing everything in your path. Vermintide 2 builds on all that with the careers, more levels, and the complexity of those levels really increasingly evident as you progress. But I certainly would be remiss if I didn't say that one thing that really hurt the fun factor in the game that I noticed was that the enemies, in particular the Chaos characters, really just popped into existence far too often within sight. Despite the fact that it'd be weird to see a Chaos Warrior climbing out of a sewer overall, it did detract from the normal and more organic feel of the Skaven. Did that cause me to not enjoy the game? No, it did not. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touch it again rating scale, with rent being replaced by deep, deep sale on PC. This is a buy. It's only $30. It is a very good price. No loot boxes, no microtransactions. The game is a blast to play. The career system is a really good boon for this title as well with the different skills. And the, the fact that you can change those skills at any time is just superb. I absolutely love that. So that is it for me. I hope you liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Maybe check out Reddit or Twitter. As always, you can become a patron on the Patreon website, which helps me give you guys reviews that are detailed, not two minutes long, not filled with sponsored bullcrap. And as always, I buy every single game I review, even if a developer gives me a code. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.